and I am very excited about our next guest. This guest is coming from Birmingham in UK, directly to our global audience through this conference, and uh, and that is Mark McGregor. Mark is uh, will be familiar to regular attendees at our events. He has shared with us on uh, his expertise on enterprise architecture, process management, and today he's going to go on to process mining and the future of process mining. Mark has deep expertise and experiences with more than 25 years of experience and work directly across the vendors, analyst firms, and end users organizations. Mark always has interesting sites to share. They're often the driver of lively discussions, and I very much look forward to your questions to Mark, a real practitioner, and uh, for us to engage with him in the Q&A in the end. Ask your questions as Mark is presenting his topics. I guarantee you this is going to be a masterclass on process mining and the future of process mining. Mark, thanks for taking the time to share your expertise with our global audience today. Thanks, Jose, and um, thanks, Brian, for uh, inviting me. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, be here with you all. And I'm just going to move myself out of the way so that I can focus on you guys. Brilliant. OK, so the future of process mining. Now, as I look to the future, everyone as we know, has, has got a bit of a bias. So I want to just get out of the way where my bias is. So um, some of you are familiar with the fact that, um, you know, although I work as an independent consultant, that I've been working with the team at Abbey. So obviously that's going to have shaped and, uh, my thinking. For those of you that are connected with me uh, on LinkedIn, you'll know that I've recently also started doing some work with a small company called WorkPath, who specialise in OKR software, so connecting strategy with execution, and then a small French company some of you may have heard of in the enterprise architecture space called Excellient. So those are people that I'm working with at the moment and so are front of mind when I think of the things that, that I want to share with you today. But prior to that, you know, never mind the fact that I spent time, as some of you know, as an analyst with Gartner, I've also worked with Signavio, with Linux, PlanView, OpenText, CaseWise, and Global360. So all of these things are where my bias comes from. So as you're listening to what I'm saying and you're thinking, well, hang on, I'm not sure whether I agree with that or disagree, and, and that's okay, right? Because that's the great thing about this. We can think for ourselves. I just wanted to share with you where my biases are coming from so you can take that into account as we look in and share. So let's dive in a little deeper. So it's a really hot topic. I know from talking with Brian, this is one of the um, best events that we've had in terms of registrations and attendees, just sh showing just how hot the topic of process mining is. But I'm also sure that most of you attending will know that actually there's a number of shifts that have been occurring really over, certainly in the last three months, a significant shift that we're going to talk to, but the shifts have been occurring now for almost two years. So listing those, some of those significant events, and there are many others, but just some that I wanted to focus on. So, you know, in May 2019, we see the Abbey acquisition of Timeline PI. In October the same year, we see UiPath acquiring Process Gold. We see Minet raising some small investment to take them to the next level. But then we start to see some other more interesting things going on more recently with the investment into Apramore last year. But the investment in Apramore, a lot of it coming from GB Tech. Now, if, for those of you that don't know GB Tech, GB Tech are a modeling tool vendor. So we see a modeling tool vendor partnering with and investing in a process mining vendor. And then just last year, we saw Solonis uh, making all their announcements around their new execution management system as they seek to appear to pivot from being a pure play process mining vendor into what they're now seeing as the execution management space. And then the one that's most front of mind for many people is the SAP acquisition of Signavio happening, well, literally only closed a couple of weeks ago. I mean, these are significant things that don't just impact the tools that we buy or how people might use it, but impact the market overall. So let's look at just some of those impacts. So we're now seeing that 
adding monitoring and mining to intelligent content automation is providing a, an easier and richer way to actually monitor what's going on around our content and the automation that's going on there and making sure that we can ensure conformance, variance, compliance, but also to make sure that we're applying that automation in the right places. Now with the UI path, of course, what we're seeing is the adding of process mining into the RPA stack. So we've got, on one hand, we've got the blending with content automation, then we see moving it into the RPA stack. As I've mentioned with the GB tech, we're seeing another continued merging of modeling and mining, which is some of you will know is a topic that I spoke about last year at this event, where we look specifically around that. And so I'm not gonna talk a lot about that today, but if you go back and look at the replays, then we can look at the modeling management um, and mining question. So it's up there on the replays. And then we see with that Salonis announcement, you know, a large player looking to seek growth outside of process mining, implying that maybe all is not what we might think in that pure play process mining space. And then with SAP, what we're seeing is ERP vendors now seeking to offer a full service solution. And I want to emphasize that full service solution because a lot of commentators have focused around you know, SAP acquiring Signavio just for the process mining. Um, I don't want to say what was in SAP's mind. I don't know what was in their heads when they made the acquisition, but I'm pretty sure that we need to take into account that actually Signavio's modeling piece probably had as much to do with that decision as, it, as the mining piece. And indeed, um, I'm gonna give you a link later on where I can share an article that I produced on BP Trends, which specifically looks at the impact of the SAP acquisition of Signavio. And in that, I talk about the fact that SAP were actually one of Signavio's largest customers. So with all those changes going on, what we actually now have is five well-funded players in the process mining market. SAP, UiPath, Abby and Salonis that I've mentioned, but what I haven't yet mentioned, of course, and we shouldn't forget, is Software AG. Software AG have been in the process mining space for a lot longer than most other vendors. They're not necessarily front of mind for a lot of people. I know that they were sharing here at this event, so that it's good that they're um, getting that message out there a little more. But these are five very large, well-funded vendors, all going in different directions. And this is going to have an impact, not just in terms of how the tools are used, but what tools are available, and quite frankly, the viability for some of the vendors going forward. So I wanted to share a little bit about the market overall. Now, some of you may have seen some of these things um, where analysts estimate that the current market is between 100 million and 400 million. Um, so, you know, some of you might have seen some Gartner numbers, some of you might have seen Forrester or other analysts, but in a rough area, they're suggesting it's between 100 and 400 million. And apologies for the typo on this, but they see it growing and they suggest it's gonna grow between 800 million and 1.4 billion by 2023, which is a pretty significant growth. Um, for what it's worth, my personal view is that the market today is really only around about 150 million. But none of those things matter because actually all of these estimates are misleading, whether it's the analyst, mine, doesn't matter. Because actually those estimates are based at looking at rent vendor revenues and the forecasted vendor growth. So oh, vendor X is at 10 million and they're gonna grow 50% to 15 million and adding all that together. But recently I've been talking a lot to um, some management consultancies and investors. And one of the things that's been interesting working with those guys is that their frustration often when looking is that very little research has been done into what is the total addressable market. So never mind what part of the market the vendors are doing, but what's the addressable market? Or what's the market penetration? So I've been doing some research over the last couple of weeks specifically into these areas. And I estimate that actually the total addressable market for process mining is somewhere between six and a half and twelve and a half billion dollars. 
this suggests that the vendors, as I say here, are only addressing three to seven percent of that to potential market. And that's a bit of a mismatch, isn't it? So that's saying that even with those that are suggesting that certain vendors are gorillas, you know, the 800 pound gorilla in the market, they're the 800 pound gorilla. And let's suppose they owned 70% of the market. That's 70%, 3%, 2.1% 2 to 5%. They don't own that much of the market. So even though we're seeing process mining being more successful today than it has been for the last what, 15 years, it's got a long way to go before it could be seen as being successful. So we're going to take a little bit of a, a dive into some of the switches here, and then we'll come back and question whether we'll ever actually see that potential being realized. So I'm in the process of um, considering a new car, and um, for anyone that doesn't recognize it, I, I'm I'm thinking about changing my Volvo and going Mercedes. Um, and it's the GLE that we see here that, that's catching my eye at the moment. But I want to use the car to give us some examples of how we should be thinking differently about process mining technology. And, you know, as I say in the title, about that shift from mining to intelligence. Because often when you hear, whether it's other sessions, whether it's vendors, whether it's even internally, talking about it you often start with well you know we're going to start mining we're going to plug it into these systems and we're going to really when i get into this car and test drive it now i don't know if i get to test drive against some nice lakes like this although it actually looks like it could be off the road um the thing that strikes me when i sit in here is it's been simplified there's an, a certain simplification and elegance now I happen to be, you know, be, being a bit of a technologist, the one thing that I love about these new Mercedes is that um, dashboard, the, the two 12 and a half inch screens. But some of the things that I find interesting is that they don't bombard me with information. I don't get in there and say, right, well, the first thing I want you to do is to have a, a look into the fuel tank and measure where this is and tell me how this plugs in and let me let me talk to you about the engine management system. No, you know, it's about my experience as the drivers, you just simply turn it on, select comfort or eco mode, and away we can start going. It's providing me the information that I need, but only what I need when I need it. It's not drowning me. So, but it's also got a whole bunch of things going on in there, which make it a pretty intelligent car, right? So let's think about it. You know, they're selling me this new car, lane assist, blind spot information, emergency call assist. It's got auto braking, adaptive cruise control, all of these things going on. And they're amazing aids for the driver. But how many of them do I see when I'm looking at the dashboard here? They're very little. They're available when I need them. And particularly when I think about um, process intelligence, now I like. The, the lane assist example, and I'm not going to give you loads of these examples, but just start thinking about them. You're driving your car along and you've got it on cruise control, and that's great, but suddenly you start to drift. Well, the light comes on, put the hand on the wheel, adjust it. It recognizes that even when everything is running smoothly, you need to be monitoring. You need to be monitoring and you need to be making suggestions as to when drift or variance or non-conformance is occurring and bring some things back into line. So that's an example with things like blind spot information and lane assist where their driver aids through the monitoring that's advising me as the user when to make a change. There are other situations, and I think adaptive cruise control is, a, is an interesting example, where the car says, actually, the vehicle in front slowing down, I'm going to slow you down. Oh, they're speeding up, we can speed up. And it's making the change for me. It's predicting 
what's going on and making the changes. But the changes are not, oh, I'm just going to break or I'm just going to accelerate. It's looking at the whole picture and ensuring that the throughput of the entire process is working seamlessly. So that's just a couple of quick examples from the driving perspective. Now let's think about it from the navigation perspective. You get in the car and of course the first thing it does is ask you to um, connect your mapping software and your probes and to run maps of everywhere in the world and to connect to all the different places. No, those are already done. What it asks you for is where do you want to go? Okay, so now I, I know your destination. I already know where you are, therefore I can calculate the route. So it's focusing around the outcomes. Now again, we've got things like lane guidance where, hey, we're gonna come off the motorway, the autobahn, the freeway, whatever it is where you are, take the left-hand lane, be prepared to merge left, take the next exit on the right, etc. So it's intelligently rerouting and replanning. So it doesn't just give us a singular route, it recognizes that there are changes occurring and it needs to adapt accordingly. Well, process intelligence does the same thing for our business. It enables us to do those things. And the one thing that I think most of us would agree is that whatever navigation system we're using, whether it's this or whether it's an, um, a CarPlay, Android, Waze, doesn't really matter. We're reliant on real-time traffic information because we know that the route that we were gonna go down, things change accidents happen, roadworks happen, we need to divert, deviate, etc. And we rely on the fact that our navigation system is constantly monitoring those things and providing us with inputs and advice. So process intelligence will provide what I call RTPI, real-time process information, so that we're not just looking at having mined that process once and ignore it, we're looking at saying, aha, we need to keep looking at it and keep planning. So you may use different analogies. These are ones that work for me. So then we come on to looking at process mining as a capability. So I've already talked about the fact that as a capability, the capabilities we want is monitoring the performance within and across processes. We want alerts, as I mentioned, for that variation and conformance. As I illustrate on the dashboard, we want simple and easy to comprehend visuals. We also want a separation of concerns between users and analysts. So if we take my car example. Um, in my current car, which is a Volvo, recently came up and told me that the stop start wasn't wor uh, working correctly and that I should take it to a garage. So when I took it to the garage and booked it in, do you think the technician had to work from just that? stop start not working seek service no the technician was then able to plug the diagnostics in and get far more information oh the battery's not charging the battery charge level is they knew a whole bunch more about that car than i did because i as a user there's no point in presenting me all that information it's not relevant to me but if i'm the analyst or developer looking to make change or fix something then I need additional or different information. One of the things that we all look at and a lot of people now talk about, if we take the car example, is we want non-intrusive. This monitoring just needs to be there without getting in our way. Staying with our car examples, and I already mentioned the CarPlay and Android Auto, well, we need it to be easily to connect to multiple systems, right? Because even if we've got that inbuilt Mercedes navigation, we may choose to plug our phone in particularly if it's an iphone and then we might whether we're using apple maps whether we're using garmin whether we're using google maps or something else we still want to be running it through that system so we want to easily connect to multiple systems and of course even the underlying mapping in those cars these days is increasingly garmin or TomTom -tom as an embedded system we also want the ability to test hypotheses yeah, I think that this is where I'm looking at putting in some new robotic process information, but is that the right thing to do? You know, if I go back to you know, lean thinking Toyota style, am I just going to 
put in a robot and sub-optimize something that I think looks great, but all I'm doing is moving the queue from one place to another? Or am I looking at the overall flow? Could there be somewhere else where applying a smaller amount of automation may increase the overall flow? I don't know, but can I test those ideas? And as I say, can it easily be integrated into those other systems? Because if we see that combination with the RPA stacks, the content automation stacks, the ERP stacks, then as we're gonna see, increasingly process mining or process intelligence as a capability is gonna be integrated into other places. So I suggest that when we look at process mining tools, actually some of the key features we're gonna be looking at for the future around APIs, customizability, configurability, OEM ability, these are going to be the next frontiers that define success or failure for many vendors. The other thing that I wanted to share a little bit about is tasks, processes, and journeys. Or as I'm showing them here, journeys, processes, and tasks, but sorry to confuse you by showing it both ways round. Because one of the challenges that I believe we all face is that increasingly process mining vendors are talking about doing task mining. Task mining vendors, and indeed some BI vendors, are actually talking about process analytics and process mining. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I scratch my head because I kind of feel that everyone is threading all over the place in terms of the language they're using, which makes it kind of tough for people like you and people like me to actually work out, well, which is the right product to solve the right problem? Because a journey is not a process, and a process is not a task, and a task is not a process. Okay, so in my mind, we have our customer journeys. We can think of them as, if you like, as a, a modern day idea of a value chain. But the chain is from the customer's perspective. So whether it's the customer, employee, patient, user, or whether it's a document, it's what steps does it go through? And that may or may not be within your process or within your system, and it may be across processes and across systems, and it may be manual. But inevitably, there are gonna be intersections where the journey connects with a process. Okay. Now I wanna drill, be able to drill down into my process. And that process, maybe it's end-to-end, -end, maybe it's discrete, doesn't really matter, because a lot of end-to-end -end processes are not the end-to-end -end processes that you may think. Rarely does an order to cash or procure to pay exist totally within a single ERP system. That's the vendor's implementation of their piece of that jigsaw. But even then within the process, the process doesn't all occur within, a, within systems, never mind a single system, because there's points at which that you or I as users interact with those systems, or we interact with each other. And that's when we're looking at tasks. And when we're looking at task mining, there are three different types of things in my mind that you can be looking at. You can be looking at specific, which is typically what the RPA vendors are doing. Hey, you want to automate this specific task. Here, run my desktop recorder, record yourself running this task, replay it back, program the bot, and now the bot's gonna do it. That's good too. Run the recorder for a little bit longer and derive some of the tasks that you as users might be doing or how they might be doing. Great. What about discovering tasks that we didn't even know existed? So for the, the last two that derived and discovered, this relies on long running recorders. So not just running a recorder while you're doing a specific task, but running a recorder for hours where you're doing just your normal daily work and the system is starting to piece together that said, aha, this, this, and this, really they belong together as a task. This, this, and this, they belong together as a task. Maybe it's a system change, maybe it's a bot, maybe it's hyper automation, but there are different ways of doing it. So they're not the same analysis. Now here, as I say, I have a bias. In this case, I happen to use Abby because Abby's one of the few vendors that actually is doing the journey process and task mining as separate pieces, if you like, within the same product. So not forcing process mining to do task mining, but actually providing the products. They require different capabilities. From what I'm seeing, I think ideally 
having them integrated into one solution that do, does them all is the smarter and better way. So how else could we and should we be looking at process mining or process intelligence? Well, I suggest that process mining is actually continuous process improvement for the 21st century. So don't be fooled by those adverts of $10 million gains. Instead, think about improving all processes. I'm a fan of professional cycling and anyone that follows it will know that Team Sky or Team Ineos as they are now, completely transformed the world of how riders prepare, how teams prepare and how races are run. They've been incredibly successful. Um, some people resent it, some people admire it. But it was all done through the concept of marginal gains. David Brailsford, the manager and original owner of the team, was saying that actually we've got to stop looking for the single big win. And each day we've got to start improving each little piece because if we can improve lots of little pieces, then the amplification of those gains is going to be far greater. And I suggest that continuous process improvement has often proved elusive in the past, and it's really well suited to these systemized ones because if we run the monitoring and we've got the conformance and we understand the drift, and we're seeing that on a day-by-day -day basis, it's much easier to get that continuous improvement. And if we do that, then not can we just automate, but we can continuously improve and optimize. But when I do that, I want you to also bear in mind that improvement isn't transformation. You know, if we take a ridiculous example and say that David Brailsford and Team Sky can do marginal gains and be wildly successful, but it won't turn them into a Le Mans 24 hour car winner, will it? Because they're, all they're doing is optimizing bike racing. So if we want to transform the way that we serve customers with new products, new services, then the mining might help us understand a little about some of our processes, but it's not going to help us transform. So we've done the monitoring. We've looked at how we can run continuous improvement. We know we've got to do some discovery and analysis. But have you ever noticed that when you start talking to people about process mining, it's often, you know, seems like people are talking about an MRI scanner, really expensive, used by a few specialist people. And yet, if we can start thinking about it more like an ultrasound, and we can make it easier to use like an ultrasound, we're going to broaden the applicability. Consider what would it mean to you and other organizations if every business and process analyst was able to apply and use process mining for the parts of the process that it was applicable for. It's a simple decision, and it's really a vendor decision first and foremost. Do we want to sell a few MRIs and be addressing two to three percent of the process mining market? Or do we want to get to 30, 40, 50 percent of the market, in which case actually we need to be selling a lot of ultrasound? Hopefully those benefits and those values are starting to resonate with you. Because it's only when those types of things that I've been talking about start to resonate with you as individuals and with your managers and execs and within your business, that you actually are willing and interested in doing the process discovery. Because higher up the, 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 the business, I can assure you, the process discovery just sounds expensive. It takes time, complicated, not easy. I'm not gonna wanna do it unless I've bought into the benefits. So going back to our semi-autonomous or autonomous cars, um, some of you may have heard me talk about it before, but I was talking with a senior exec from a large auto manufacturer a couple of years ago, and they were saying that the single thing that gets in their way, the biggest barrier to moving self-driving or semi-autonomous cars forward isn't regulation, it isn't technology, it's actually having accurate, detailed, up-to-date mapping. So why is it that we think in our business that we would ever be able to make those kind of equivalent decisions steering our, our car as the business around 
without accurate mapping and without detail in those maps. So if self-driving cars can't function, we can't either. You know, our systems may be easier than roads, but in both cases, roadblocks are going to occur. So we need to find ways of having that level of detail and in the easiest way possible. And where we have systemized processes, then it doesn't make any sense to use anything other than process mining and automated process discovery. There's just no other way of doing it. You actually can't do it manually. Because even when you try and do it manually, you're still relying on extracting knowledge, data, logs, or whatever in a systematic way, even if you're going to perform a manual analysis of that information. So turning to the future, <clears throat> excuse me, just to start to um, bring us to the close here, so we've got some time for some discussion. These are my predictions for the process mining market. Uh, I'm not alone. So in the first one is, I don't believe that the process mining market as a standalone market will exist, and I believe it will disappear within 18 to 24 months. I'm not going to name names on here, but you know, former colleagues of mine likened it to the business rules market. Lots of potential, but it was never going to see the light of day as a standalone market. Process mining as a capability will continue to exist but I believe it's going to be consumed into products that address multiple other markets and will grow in use. I think as we look at the rest of this year, we're going to see a lot more in terms of partnerships and acquisitions, and that will continue to drive our headlines for 2021. I still think, unfortunately, much as I would love to see clarity, that we're going to see continued confusion and overlapping marketing messages between the task, the process, and the journeys. However, sadly, I believe that that's also going to contribute to slowing down rather than speeding up potential uptake, because it's going to be too confusing for us to actually work out how to take on a product, who to believe, how to use it. I also think that we're going to see a little bit of a, a bifurcation on pricing. So I think some players will take process mining capability, drive it down so it becomes a little bit like modeling and applies to that general business analyst market so much lower price um less thinking about the, the value of the problem and more thinking about how much an individual might be willing to spend for the capability and then we're going to see it go the other way where we see them moving almost as a, a business monitoring type system a lot of like the business intelligence and analytics stuff where monitoring will be sold high as an enterprise solution for enterprise value so in one case, we're going to be selling to users, and the other case is going to be an enterprise pricing. So you may wish to discuss that. You may be getting ready to type your questions into Jose now to, to get ready to discuss, and I'm happy to dig into those. But from what I'm seeing, that's my predictions as to where it's going. So what does it mean for those of you that are looking to evaluate or acquire the technology? Well, my suggestions are that when you're evaluating the technologies, Focus on the vendor viability rather than the technical capability. I don't think you'll find there's enough differentiation between products um, that you should be excited by something that's radically new. So focus on that vendor viability. That's going to be more important to you. Make sure that you give full considerations to how whatever solution you're thinking about is going to fit in your current vendor ecosystem. Okay, the other tools you use, the other systems, etc. Despite what I've said about where the market's going, please don't allow those potential disruptions to prevent the implementations. It's, it's not a big deal because actually the cost of moving from one vendor to another is not that high. So there's not that much risk there. Go ahead, the value that you can gain from it is more than you're going to get from the risk of making a, a bad decision. Don't be afraid to consider multiple solutions in the short term. You may find that you've got a particular vendor that you want to use for one particular type of system based on their wonderfully amazing monitoring, but you might want to use a different vendor if you're getting closer to the analyst community. It's no big deal. And really, in the short term, it doesn't matter having multiple solutions. 
don't be fooled by the vendor hype. There are a number of people out there making some, quite frankly, ridiculous claims. Um, you know, I'm seeing things like first free. Well, hang on a minute. There's been free products in the space for a long time. Um, so don't be fooled by the vendor hype. Do focus your efforts on the technologies and capabilities that address multiple opportunities. So even if someone says, wow, we, yeah, well, we're not sure about how we're going to deal with that problem, but we're really good at this problem, don't let them derail you. You need solutions that are going to address multiple process challenges. And if you take and follow this advice, then I think you're going to be in a good place. Um, I hope that nothing that I've said puts you off leveraging and using mining and process intelligence because you really shouldn't. It's an amazing technology. But on the other hand, you need to be clear on where it's going overall. And it may be that you start talking to your ERP or RPA or other vendors as to what they're going to be doing. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and invite Jose to come back and join us. Excellent, Mark. Excellent. Always insightful, thought-provoking, and uh, lots of uh, of uh, comments and uh, and uh, questions coming in your way as a result of that. So the many people saying thank you, great presentation, great insights. Um, let's let's go on, get on with some of the, some of the first few questions here. Uh, and one of the themes that I would like to summarize and 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 ask you about is that um, you're implying that you know. Process mining as a pure play is has kind of will have a short life, and uh, so so first of all, I want to confirm that that that's kind of a view that you have based on your understanding of the market, and then and then the, what will will what will be be absorbed by and be part of uh, going forward? What how is it going to evolve? Is go, is it going to evolve in your view? Sure. So you're absolutely right. Yes, I am. Categoric in stating my belief that um, the market as a process mining market will disappear. So I'll go as far as to say the only thing I'm unsure about is maybe my timing estimate may be slightly out. Now, I do want to also say though that even when that disappears in my mind as a mainstream market, there will still be a number of small vendors operating in that niche because not everyone's trying to grow a billion dollar business. You know, there are going to be some great technologies with a brilliant idea that quite frankly, although they don't like to admit it, you and I know from our experience, if they can just admit that actually we want to build a lifestyle business where we have our 20, 30 employees who all feel good coming to work, who serve the community that they work in and are able to feed their families, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Not everyone has to be that billion dollar organization. So I think there's going to be a number of those smaller players that are out there solving specialist problems. And I wish them great luck. But the other piece that you mentioned there is if we look at UiPath and what they've done, um, and I apologize for the guys at UiPath that may have been presenting a different story, but when I look at it, I don't see them out there in the mainstream market. I don't see UiPath talking about process mining without talking about RPA. And it makes sense. You know, most of their revenues come from RPA. But of course, they've got process mining. And in the RPA space, they've got a leg up over their competitors by combining the two things together. Now we see SAP having mining in their stack. Well, how long can the other ERP vendors go on without? saying, well, gee, hang on a minute, I need to put process mining in my stack. So if the other RPA vendors have to respond and the other IERP vendors have to respond, pretty soon there's nothing much left and it becomes a capability in that larger piece. But I also will throw one other thing out there, which is if we look at the monitoring and the conformance, at what point does process analytics start to merge with business intelligence? So will we see the traditional business intelligence and analytics vendors saying, well, you know, actually by the time these guys build the dashboarding and we've got the dashboarding and we've got the connectors, well, why don't we just acquire that piece and we'll really do business intelligence by looking at data and process, not just data. 
So those are three of the obvious places in my mind. So uh, around that theme again, uh, we can talk about this probably for a few hours, but <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best here to summarize. Uh, so do you, uh, two questions, let me start first. Do you feel that it's a natural tendency for process mining functions to become part of ERP systems as well? Do you think there's gonna be more consolidation on ERP systems uh, looking to absorb some of these process mining capabilities and on and uh, subsequent uh, follow up on that? Do you see RPA going the same route as process mining in terms of being absorbed over time? Or do you see that RPA will remain independent? Gee, Jose, you always ask me the the questions that I just think, Brian, why don't you give us an hour's discussion in one of these slots of Jose and I? Because we don't need the presentation, because these, these are big topics in themselves. So the short answer is RPA should have been consumed, but it's defied the normal laws of software. And that is that a few vendors got some very big valuations which meant that where they would traditionally have been acquired at a much smaller, they now got valuations that are not sustainable, which is kind of interesting because, you know, if you take the SAP example, then they bought Contexta, a very small RPA vendor. Why? Because the build versus buy decision wasn't making sense. Buy has historically been the approach in, a, in the space that we operate in. But when you start seeing I'm going to say crazy valuations because most people don't necessarily believe in the let's broaden it to just a singular RPA in the hyper automation space. The vendors are getting valuations that don't make any logical sense, which means that actually they're creating more competitors because I can no longer afford to buy one. I have to build. So suddenly it's getting squeezed. So I don't you know, I'm really interested to see whether. Um, we just find RPA disappearing in three to five years and all the other vendors will rush to the hyper automation. So if you like the RPA V3 and trap them in the, in the early place or whether we'll see more acquisitions from RPA vendors. And I don't think we've seen, seen those guys using those valuations to turn the market on its head. You know, we should have seen more acquisition, shall we say, of customer experience into RPA, or more acquisitions of process mining vendors by, they're not using that valuation visibly to move out of that space, which is kind of interesting because to me, it's a burning platform. I agree, really interesting perspectives you have there. It may be part of, part of their strategies to remain on a pure play for a period of time and be valued that way. And as you said, maybe a bit overvalued, um, who knows, time will tell. And uh, but there will be some interesting developments coming through. Um, uh, one one <clears throat> one final quick question here for those who are actually in the process of using process mining, they are starting to implement it, and they come to your presentation. I was like, they start to freak out because like I'm not sure what I should be doing anymore. <laughs> Is how they how do they take it forward? They started doing some process mining. Do you still see value in the process mining activities that they can do in the organization? Or, or you say, you know, this is a train that's going in a direction that you want to go, get out of the train. So what is your perspective on those who have already started down this path? Keep going. Um, absolutely. And as I say, remember really clearly, I was only talking about whether process mining exists as a standalone market for products as opposed to a capability. I think we can be really, the capability is not going to go away. Okay. I'm a fan of post-it notes and manual type workshopping. Everybody knows that and I don't subscribe to and I resent when people tell me that automated process mining can get rid of that and replace it. For me, it cannot because you're only mining system information. I can workshop and white post whether it's manual in this system, it doesn't matter. And there's other dynamics at play. But another graphic that I use, if you imagine sitting there at your post-it wall on there, you've got everything. Now imagine that sitting, standing in front of the wall, instead of Mark and Jose, is R2, D2, and C3PO. And the one thing you can be sure of is they're not telling you what they do. <laughs> so if you've already got it in the system, the only way to extract it from systems is through some kind of automated process discovery or process mining. So it's absolutely not going away. 
but it just may not be in the products that you might have thought it was in the future. But I also want to reiterate something else that I made, and I think this is important, Jose, is don't be afraid because actually the switching cost from capability A to vendor B to vendor is pretty low. So it's not something that you find if you started off going down a path using one vendor and you had to change, you're not going to be in a situation where someone says, whoa, hang on, we've invested a fortune in this particular. No, because all of the analysis that you did, you can reuse. You might have to rebuild some dashboards and you might have to get used to a bit of a different user interface. But this is one of the other problems for the process mining vendors. And I talk about this with the investors all the time. The switching costs is minimal. That's right. That's right. Mark, uh, we're out of time now, but I want to thank you so much for sharing expertise. It's always a masterclass on the on, on these technological areas. And uh, I always learn so much by listening to you and engaging with you. As you and I discussed before, we can probably just have a 45-minute Q&A and, and that would not be enough. And uh, so, But thank you so much from Birmingham in the UK to over 2,000 participants in our global audience uh, in, this, in this session. Um, uh, thank you for sharing expertise with all of us. Jose, a pleasure as ever. Take care, everybody. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, Mark McGregor there for us, and uh, always, again, a master class, and uh, we're grateful that, uh, that he's able to share his expertise with all of us today. Uh, we're going to go from Birmingham to London next. I'm going to welcome, at the top of the hour, two, um, two uh, industry leaders in BPM. So we're going to, some of you ask questions about BPM that I didn't have time to get to uh, during this Q&A. Uh, we're going to have the next session focus on improving customer experience ex excellence using process mining. And we're going to go deeper onto the, onto the BPM and modeling side of things. And uh, so um, we're looking at how we translate CX and C strategy into tangible results through strategic alignment of customer strategy with operational processes that Caitlin and, uh, and Rakesh will, will discuss and demonstrate the, their approach to delivering customer experience improvements and how the digital tool sets have evolved in this space. So another fascinating view of, uh, of process mining in the context of the customer experience journey. Um, so I see you all at the top of the hour. Uh, remember, if you wanna, if you have other questions, if you wanna interact with our speakers, if you wanna ask questions or just say thank you for sharing your expertise, uh, look under my name, Jose Pires, on LinkedIn. I have a post in there about this conference. And now, you know, submit your questions there, you know, your comments, and uh, I will, I will be updating with a summary of today and tomorrow, sometime probably tomorrow. And um, um, and I you know I look forward to engaging with you in that discussion during and after the conference. Um, so for now, wrapping up here. See you back at the top of the hour.